I'm going uh, to ask you to go ahead and join me standing as I go into that. I'm going to unpack these Beatitudes just a little bit more. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. I covered this last week. I'm going to retouch again today. One day he saw the crowds gathering, he being Jesus. Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. Let's pray. Father, Father, I pray you bless the reading of your word this morning. Father, would you give me the very thoughts and the very words to speak this morning, Lord? Not mine, yours. Father, will you speak to your people this morning, Lord? Set aside the distractions of our minds and our hearts and help us to focus on what it is you have for us this morning. Father, I pray your spirit would touch the hearts and the minds of each and every person that is here. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now remember, I told you I, shared, I saw a movie when I was a kid about Jesus and how his popularity was soaring. And I really didn't think too much of it until actually I became an adult and I saw the movie The Passion of the Christ. You've seen Jesus was passing through these towns and people were, the people were mobbed. There was, there was a, it was a, there was a circus. People were coming to see the next miracle. They wanted to see his popularity is gaining. And in the movie, The Passion of the Christ, you see the tail end of it. But still, nonetheless, there was a lot of people that he drew. Now, on the beginning of that, the front side of that, it may have looked prestigious. That the disciples said, hey, I get to be one of his inner 12. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to share this truth with you. Uh, at my last church, when I was going to be ordained to be a deacon, I really didn't know what that meant. And I was kind of humbled by it. I'm like, I don't know, man. I, I don't know if I want to do that. Uh, and, and I believe it was a true humility. I, I was truly didn't feel, didn't feel qualified to be a deacon. And I had a brother tell me, hey, well, you know, that makes you qualified because you're humble in spirit and blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, okay. So when I became a deacon, I'm like, ordination, man, wearing a suit up front. The other five, there were six of us ordained on the same day. It was a big deal. They had a cake. I'm thinking, man, that's pretty cool. Well, I'm here to tell you, it ain't cool. Because <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, you know, we're in the office of deacon, office of pastor, we're kind of helping lead the church. I'm going to tell you, church, the tremendous responsibility that came with that as the deacon's role in that church was different than it is here. But the tremendous responsibility that came with that and the uh, work that took place. We had a gym where we worshipped in a gymnasium. Chairs like these had to be set up because we had to have it open Monday through Saturday because we had a daycare center. So we had to set those chairs up Saturday after daycare at 6 when they closed up shop. Somebody had to set those chairs up for Sunday morning service. Who do you think did that? That would be, yeah. And I remember days where Brother Frank and I were, uh, <laughs> we, we were at, my, at his house, we were ready to go see a movie. And the girls were like, yeah, we catch a movie, starts at 8. I look at Frank, and Frank's like, we better go get them chairs up because we're going to leave and catch the movie at 8, and it's 6. So we swooped down to the church. We got it down, didn't we? Yeah, we knocked them chairs out in 45 minutes. 45 minutes, we get the chairs up, and we get back to the house, and the girls are like, ooh, we go see a movie, and we go see a movie. But that was a sacrifice. Saturday or whatever, it was our turn to set. You just couldn't leave. You couldn't go. And the, but you know what? People come in on Sunday, sat down on the chairs. They didn't think about who set them up. But at the end of service, we had to break them down, slide them to the side. Everybody was part of that. But nobody, everybody thought you just <laughs> clap on and the chairs were in place. But there's a lot of stuff that's going on behind the scenes. I wish. Amen. I wish we figured that one out. But there's, there's things that are going on behind the scenes. So when you, when you become a deacon or when you become a, 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 a posi into a position, you think it brings pro power and prestige. But what do we know about leadership according to the Bible? The Bible teaches servant leadership. He who wants to be first must be willing to be last and pick up the crumbs that everybody else. How many times we push the dust mop? How many times we spot mopping the mess, mess? Everybody else is gone. We're lugging and slinging trash and everybody else standing around talking, sipping coffee. Oh, you're going to garbage? Here, take this with you and give you your cup. And I'm like, and, you, and we're not complaining because I love to do it. All I'm saying is that was servanthood. We're serving, and not because I was getting paid to do it, but because it was the desire of my heart, and it's what God had called me to, and I did it, and I was glad to do it. I was grateful to do it. It was an opportunity for me to serve God with the talent he's given me, a servant's heart. Amen? I used to say, well, what's the point? The point was, my initial thought of being a deacon thought, this is going to be pretty cool. It's not cool. <laughs> Dirty hands is what you're going to get. You're a foot washer at best. It's like Jesus modeled with his disciples. Hmm, true servanthood. Now, Jesus comes out. Now, this is what we know, church. The disciples didn't know that. He said, I'm picking 12. One, I told you, me, two. 
Me, me, three. And he's picking his 12 and they're thinking, this is going to be great. And Jesus said, not so fast. Okay? So this is what's happening. And it is a natural human tendency. When asking for volunteers, we think we're going to do something good. And they did. It just wasn't what they thought. So he takes his 12 and he sits them on the mountainside, the Bible says, and Jesus tells them, he begins to teach them. Verse 3, I'm reading out of the NLT. He says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. You think that's what they expected to hear? No, the disciples, he's telling them, listen, I picked you because you're, you got nothing to offer. I picked you because you're, a, in layman's terms, you're a dud. You got nothing to offer. God blesses you when you realize that you've got nothing to offer. You're a crumb at best, and he's choosing you. And you come to him and you say, Lord, you realize your need for him. The Bible says, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Number, verse 4, he says, God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You know, when you're actually serving, it can be like Brother Warren said, where you're mopping the floor. Oh. Brother Jay told me when he came out, I was supposed to bring some help to get these leaves, but by myself and he just kept raking and he stopped and talked to me I'm gonna get this and and he was still smiling you know sometimes it ain't fun it ain't you know where the Bible says God blesses those who mourn God blesses those who are poor and they realize their need for him now we think that the blessings of God are gonna come financial that means he's gonna give me the job I want that might not work that way church so he's the Bible says he blesses those who mourn for they will be comforted those who are mourning they realize their need for him Verse 5, now remember, what is he doing here? He picked 12, and these 12 are like, yeah, this is what being a deacon, this is what being an apostle entails, this is what that means, and Jesus said, that's not what it means. The Beatitudes, these blessed, God, blessed is he, or God blesses those, whatever translation you're reading, is almost like a code of ethics. Jesus is telling you, if you are my apostle, if you are my disciple, this is what you can expect. This is what you should model. Look at verse 5. God blesses those who are humble. Humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. Brother Blaine built this uh, thing for our kids in, uh, for vacation Bible school. The boys and the girls were having a penny drive, see who had, who had more money. And so Blaine built this teeter-totter thing. So in the girl's bucket would go down like that. They're like, ooh, we're winning. Well, not necessarily because coins could be heavier than the dollar bills, but they didn't know. So the kid's are like, yeah, it's heavier, and it's going back and it's forth like this. The point of the teeter-totter is that one end can't go down, but the other end can't. The other end has to come up if one end goes down. It, that's just the way it's designed. Amen? So when you're talking about humility, humility is when you truly recognize that, you know what, without God, you're, not, you're nothing. You're created by him and for him. And without him, the Bible says nothing was made that was made. So when you recognize that God is truly God, when you recognize his significance in your life, when you recognize the blessings that he's poured out, the Bible says all oh, the gifts that come down, that come to you, the blessings that come to you come from God Almighty. When you recognize that, you can't help but exalt God on high and say, man, God is good. And when you do that, the opposite end is true. You humble yourself. You recognize there's nothing you can do on your own accord that brings you up here. The Bible says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will bring you in due time, in his time. So the Bible here says, humility is the opposite of pride. At the root of every sin is pride. God blesses those who are humble, it says, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who are hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. In this oppressive government that they were living in, the Jews at the time, they wanted justice. But that's not what God is talking about. God is talking about those, when you see the, when we as Christians have a responsibility to defend the brokenhearted, those who can't defend themselves. I had a policeman once tell me, and this is, this is common for every rookie that comes on. I took a vow, I, I took an oath, and my oath is to serve and protect the citizens, especially those who cannot protect themselves. When I first started working in the schools, as a security officer in the schools, I was a policeman. My, and I know this is going to sound crazy, but my goal, I'll, I'll make it so it don't sound crazy. My goal was to protect those little kids who couldn't protect themselves. Not only from the gunmen who may come through the door shooting like we've seen, but from the bullies in the school. You got this little kid, poor kid standing in line, he's quiet, he won't say nothing, he's 
sweet and quiet spirit. He's standing in line and some bigger kid comes and move, wimp, and it goes, cuts in front of him. I stand in the cafeteria and then I'd come and bump into the big bully and say, hey, how'd you like if I cut you? What you gonna do about it? He looks at me and I'm like, and not because I'm a policeman, but because I'm a man and I'm bigger than you are. How you like that? They look at me like, I said, how about I just take your lunch after you get your tray and eat it? What are you going to do about that? You're looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm going to tell my mama. I said, you know, my point is that you, can't, you can bully people because you're bigger than you are. You know, and I'm defending the weak. I'm looking out for them. And we as Christians have the same responsibility. We should be looking out for those who are oppressed, those who are actually being taken advantage of. These are things we should cry out for justice. Watch the news. There's a lot going on in the news that most Christians don't, they won't say nothing about. Do we hunger and thirst for justice? The Bible says they will be satisfied. When? In the year 2016, when we vote for a new president? Blessed is he who is merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This is one of my favorite ones. This is why I'm merciful with people. I deal with people, I'm very tolerant with people because when I mess up, sooner or later I will step on your toes. And when I do, I can assure you it wouldn't be on purpose. And I would hope and appreciate that you would show me some mercy. And this is why I'm merciful with people. It wasn't true when I was a young man. Didn't care. Verse 8. So what am I saying? When I was a young man, I wasn't merciful. But as a man of God, I am. The Beatitudes are a code of ethics that believers should cling to. It is how we should behave. We should show people mercy. We should have pure hearts, according to verse 8. We should work for peace, according to verse 9. And if you're persecuted for doing right, you'll be blessed as well. When people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things about you because you are my followers, Jesus says, be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. In heaven. People are like, forget that. I might live to be 80 years old and I'm halfway there. I got to live another lifetime just to get there. I want my blessings now. Well, the Beatitudes or the Code of Ethics is for spiritual people. And your blessings are spiritual. And the uh, blessings of God are not necessarily laughter and, and, and power and prestige. It's not like that. That, that kingdom is in contrast to the worldly kingdom is in contrast to the spiritual kingdom of God. And so God is saying, listen, you are children of God. You ought to behave in this way. You ought to have mercy in your hearts. You should desire justice. This is the mark. This is the benchmark of the true believer of God. So I ask you, church, read through those verses and ask yourself, how are you doing? It's not multiple choice. I told you I like verse 7. Was it 7 that said merciful? Verse 7 says merciful. I like that one. That's one of my favorite ones. But guess what? It's not a buffet. You don't take two scoops of ham and leave the mashed potatoes. You take them all. It's a code of ethics. This is how believers should behave. These are the things that should be uh, indicative in a believer's life. How are you doing there? Go around the checklist. Because if you bat 9 out of 10, you're doing pretty good, but you still got work to do. Amen? So don't be so quick to judge somebody else who only is getting 3 out of 10. Because you are not there yourself. I told you we talk about this instant gratification society in which we live in. Nobody wants to wait for the blessings of God in heaven. They want them here on earth right now. So Jesus teaches about this Beatitudes. And then he moves into another topic as he moves into verse 13. And he talks about salt. Now, as you examine these things in context, see, we could talk about the salt of the, of the earth. We could talk about the Beatitudes. When you smash them together, you start to see something different. This is why I went back. How are you doing? When I was in the army, we had a code of ethics. You had to, uh, every profession has one. Lawyers can't do X, Y, and Z according to their code of ethics. No, something like that. Uh, doctors can't do certain things according to their code of ethics. Policemen can't do certain things because of their code of ethics. People see a policeman and they see him sleeping on the job. Well, what's wrong? He ain't breaking the law. He ain't hurting nobody. It's unethical to sleep on the job. You're paying them to be patrolling, looking for criminals, not taking a snooze. Okay, we all have a code of ethics. This is what governs our behavior. Amen? And so Jesus lays out these beatitudes and he says, listen, this is your code of ethics. Now, it's really cool because I want to draw your attention to them before I move on. Um, not only are they a code of ethics, 
but they contrast the kingdom's values with the worldly values that the apostles probably were expecting. And so we as Christians, you come in and say, well, uh, I, I want to be Christian because uh, God answers his, your prayers. My sister Candida, as you all know, has had been, been diagnosed with breast cancer. And we prayed for her and we lifted her up before the Lord and God, glory to God, she's come out on the other side of that. Amen. So you say, amen, it was pretty good to be Pastor Jose. You know, God answers prayers. You know, well, I'll tell you this much. Just this week, I got a phone call. I have six sisters, for those of you who don't know. I got a phone call from my other sister who's been diagnosed with breast cancer. So God's not good, right? He's always good, church, all of the time. We don't follow him for what we can get from him. Those are, that's a worldly kingdom mentality. We pray for my sister. Her name's Yvette. Pray for her as she goes on this journey and we go with her and it's a long way to go, but uh, just pray for my sister. My point is this. God cannot be manipulated. So not only is it a code of ethics, but it contrasts the kingdom values and also it contrasts superficial faith. I'm a Christian, really. Are you... Poor in spirit? Do you realize your need for God? Do you mourn for those and for injustice? Do you seek, uh, are you humble? Are you seeking and hungering and thirsting for justice? Are you merciful? Are your heart, is your heart pure? Are you working for peace? Are you being persecuted? That's the true mark of a Christian, persecution. Yeah, that's what the church needs today. We don't want to hear that, but it's true. But the last thing about these Beatitudes is this. It shows how the Old Testament expectations of this Messiah are to be fulfilled in the new. And any Jew, this is why Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think you, they bring life. He says, but if you search the scriptures, you would have saw that it points to me. That's what Jesus said, and you've missed it. What you see is, so these Beatitudes, he's showing how their expectations of what this Messiah is supposed to be, how it fits in the New Testament. And this is what Jesus did. All in one sermon, there's four, four different levels of what he was talking about. That's how deep Jesus is. And I'm sure it's deeper than that. Just far too much for me to comprehend, I'm sure. I'm going to go into a couple of passages. I'm going to ask you, Brother Frank, if you wouldn't mind to look up John 3, 17, 18, and 19. You're going to read those three when I ask you to. Brother Dennis, if you wouldn't mind, look in chapter 8, same book, John, chapter 8, verse 12. Hold that spot. and uh, Brother Manny, if you don't mind, find a spot in the book of John, chapter 9, verse 5, and just hold that spot until I get to you. In context, as we examine the Beatitudes, we see the code of ethics as a Christian is supposed to live. And ask yourself, are you living that? We're quick to take the microscope and turn it and look at our brother. He's not. Never mind him. What about you? The Word of God is a mirror, not a microscope. Hold it up and tell me how you're doing. You want to judge somebody? Judge yourself. And not by your own standards, but by God's. As we look in the mirror and say, ah, oh, I'm not looking so bad. You know, I'm packed on a few pounds, but I'm not as fat as so-and-so. Well, don't compare yourself to so-and-so. We want to compare ourselves to other people and whatever else when you really should look in the mirror and examine yourself against the measuring stick of God. You want to judge somebody? Start there. The scripture teaches that, does it not? As it tells you to pull the plank out your own eyeball before you start complaining about the speck of dust in somebody else's. These beatitudes are we should be living, church. That's my point. Moves into teaching about the salt and light. Check this out. Chapter 5, verse 13, he says, you, this is coming on the hills. Remember in chapter 12, chapter 5, verse 12, this is what he says. Be happy about it. Be very glad for great rewards await you in heaven. And remember that the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Jesus goes. <sighs> That's Jesus. All right. That was an illustration. There's a pause there. And then he says, you are the salt of the earth. These, they're connected. Chapter 5, verse 12, where he talks about the Beatitudes and he says, consider yourself persecuted being a blessing. Pause. You are the salt of the earth, he says. And what good is salt if it, lo if it lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? Two weeks ago, 
the, the Lord spoke through Teresa and she didn't even know it. I was at their house for Nolan's birthday party and she said something and I went, hmm, I said, that's interesting, as I knew the salt passage was coming next week. But not next week because that was last week. I knew it was two weeks ahead. And I said, that was interesting. And Frank, because he's the husband and there's a lot going on in his house, he looks at me, he goes, hmm, and he just keeps doing what he's doing. He heard me, he looked at me, acknowledged what I said and said, whatever. And he did what he's doing. I was talking about her comment in the kitchen. You, you probably remember. I didn't even tell you. This is what she said. I think it was potato salad. You remember? Little salt goes a long way, she said. And you got to put it in from the beginning because if you wait too long, you'll never get it right later. You have to dump in buckets. And by then, it's just all jacked up. And it doesn't work that way. You got to put a pinch here and a pinch there. And whoop, pow, potato salad. Bam. Masterpiece. Because the right amount of salt. And I went, wow. That was pretty good. And I said, thank you, Lord. Because the whole salt passage, what does it mean? First of all, <laughs> my wife is a pretty darn good cook. We'll go somewhere to eat, and she'll be like, needs more salt. <laughs> pass the salt, pass the pepper. She gets this from her mom, I know. Sorry, Odie. And it's like, salt and pepper, man. Season it up. It's got to taste good. Me, I eat it like it comes. It could be bland. I'm eating. We're practical, right, John? We're guys. I'm hungry. I eat. As long as my food ain't moving, I'm eating it. Okay, women are like, it don't taste too good. I'm like, whatever. But anyway, salt <laughs> makes it taste good. Amen? Amen? But it does more than taste good. It preserves. Jesus says, do we have the words up there? No, don't have them. He said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. After he went through the Beatitudes. The world in which we live in is dying. And the only thing that preserves is salt. They didn't have their deep freezers like we got. They didn't have dry ice and vacuum tight seals. They used salt to, to preserve. It's just a big deal. The world in which we know is decaying. And the church, the Christian, was called to preserve it. Think I'm kidding? Genesis chapter 19. There's an encounter between Abraham and God Almighty. God says, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Yep. And, and then Abraham says, uh, God, would you spare this wicked cities if I found 100 righteous people? Just 100? And God said, yes, I would. Because 100 righteous people would be the preservative to a world that was decaying. Maybe those 100 people can get revival going and swing the things back around. God said, yeah, I'll spare it for 100. How about 70? How about 60? How about 50? And he kept, he was bargaining with God. And he ends up going down. How many did he say? Anybody remember? One. One? Ten? Ten. I think ten. Ten. So God is going to destroy two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. That's like destroying Hammond and East Chicago. And he's willing to spare Hammond and East Chicago if he can find ten righteous people. Why? Because those ten righteous people are the salt for how many? 30. 30? Keep reading. You keep reading. He goes down. He bars from 30 to 20, 20 to 10. He keeps going. 10. Take five righteous people in ham and five righteous in East Chicago, and God says, I will spare them in the hope that those five and five would preserve this decaying society. The reason why God, the Bible says God is not lazy. He's not slack as some consider people to be slack, but he is patient that everyone would come unto repentance. Our responsibility as Christians is to be salt and help preserve this dying and decaying world. That's what he's saying. On the heels of the Beatitudes. Your job, church, is to keep this world we live in from getting flushed down the commode. But instead, we blend in with the church. The church blends in with society. We say nothing. And Jesus says, what good is it if you lose your saltiness? And the potato salad, according to Teresa, it's too late. You got to have the salt from the start because trying to add it later, it's just, it don't work that way. Am I right? My quote, my, it's a fair quote. The salt preserves, church. We're the salt of the earth. And what good are we if we lose our saltiness? We're not preserving anything. We're part of the solution or we're part of the problem. We're not living according to the Beatitudes. We're not following this code of ethics and we've lost our saltiness and we're living in a world and we're not helping. In fact, we're helping flush it down the toilet faster. 
That's what we're doing. As we Christians continue to live a life of hypocrisy and we say, well, I don't know. You know, the code of ethics is right here. Strive to meet them. He says, can you make it salty again? The answer is no, you cannot. He says, what good is it except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot? It's worthless. Here in northwest Indiana, we'll take that salt, throw it on the ice in the wintertime. So it's not worthless for us. But as far as tasting and preserving, it's garbage. Amen? Then he says, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, let your good deeds shine out so that all can see. So that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. You say, Pastor, where are you going with this? Well, glad you asked. Salt brings out the, the, brings out the, the preservative. It brings out the taste in food. Amen? Mm -hmm. Jesus said, you are the salt. And we are the salt of the earth. When I think of bringing out, drawing out, I think of a, of a coach. I used to coach. And I can look at a kid and say, man, that kid's got talent. Raw talent that needs to be coached out of him. As salt of the earth, we can, bring out the, we can bring out the best in people by pointing them to Jesus. But we choose not to, church. I'm telling you, we're doing a horrible job. If you don't believe me, ask yourself. Don't answer out loud. When's the last time you shared your faith with someone? When's the last time you've led somebody to the Lord? When's the last time? Just ask yourself that. How are you doing? I can assure you we're doing a horrible job, church, of being the salt of the earth. I can assure you that. It's evident. So when Jesus says you are the light of the world, read your passage, Frank. Jesus said it. I just said it, right? He says, what did I just say? I don't want to misquote. He says, you are the salt of the earth. What good is it if you lose your saltiness except to be trampled on underfoot? And verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world, he says. Read your verses, Frank. send his son into the world to condemn it but to save it there is no judgment awaiting those who trust in him but those who do not trust in him have already been judged for not believing in the only son of God their judgment is based on this fact the light from heaven came into the world but they loved the darkness more than the light for their actions were evil we're talking about light and he says, the light of the world came down from heaven. So who are we talking about? Jesus, Christ. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Yeah. Amen? Amen? In that passage, Jesus is the light of the world. Dennis, read your passage. John 8, 12. It says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will, ha but will have the light of life. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me. Will not, walk in darkness, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light, but will have the light of life. Mm -hmm. Your passage reads, Manny? 9-5. Nine, nine, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. <laughs> as long as I'm in the world, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Yet he tells these apostles, he says, you and those who are gathered on the hillside for the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you are the light of the world. How is that possible? We're reflectors of his light. Right. Amen. Jesus Christ's light shines, and his light shines, and we reflect the light of Christ. Jesus is gone now. He's in heaven, yet we are to be the light in his absence, reflecting the light of Christ. You know the word, oh, Christian. What does that mean? It means little Jesus, little Christ. Are you? How do you measure up there? How do you live your life? It matters, church. It matters. It's not okay to go off to work and you utter your profanities. It's not okay to sit in front of your computer screen and look at whatever it is you're looking at. It's not okay to do all these devious, diabolical, backhanded things that you know you would never do if Jesus Christ was standing right next to you. It's not okay. And then you say, well, I'm not hurting anybody. Sure you are. You're hurting yourself, number one. You're not reflecting the light of God. That's for sure. Yet Jesus says, you are the light of the world. He says, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. I remember when I was stationed in Germany, Tina and I were traveling through a town and we were passing, we we're on the Autobahn, so you catch, you, it's fast. But you're driving, it's getting late, and I can see this town, it's called Stuttgart, it's huge. And oh, it is lit up, it is on the mountainside, it is beautiful. But you know what? You weren't going to miss it because it's a city on the hill and it's, it's there for everybody to see. 
You know what Christians do? Uh, I'm trying to think of the song. Maybe you can help me out. And I'm, I'm trying not to sing it. People say, why do we sing, Pastor? Because it's hard to recite lyrics without singing them. Somebody asked me, in the, uh, can you say your ABCs without singing them? Most people are like, A, B, C, D. There's still a melody you're following. In the Army, they'd ask us to spell military police without chanting it. M-I-L-I-T-A-R-Y-P-O-L-I-C-E. It's part of a cadence. You learn it that way. And so when I'm thinking of songs, I can't say them. I have to sing them. That's a big part of the problem. So the song is this little light of mine. You know it? Yeah. I'm going to let it shine, right? right? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And it says, uh, what's the... Not, Hide it under a bushel, right? No! I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel? No! I'm going to let it shine. There's another part of that, right? Won't let Satan blow it out. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Amen? This is a song we teach the little kids. This little light of mine. I had a brother at another church. I hate singing. I hate songs. I don't like music. And he'd sing that song with his little daughter. This little light of mine. I said, gotcha. Got him. Something about that song. You say, what's the point, Pastor? This is what most Christians do. We receive this light of the Lord. We receive this light of God, and we put it under a bush. We hide it. We don't want the world to know. We want to hide it. Shh, don't let nobody know I'm a Christian. It's kind of embarrassing. We don't live lives any different than everybody else. We were at a men's, <laughs> men's outing yesterday, and uh, the, one of the speakers, he said... Uh, he mentioned he had to preach a sermon at church, and he mentioned at work to his friends. He said, hey, uh, I, I got to prepare a sermon uh, for church. And his friend looked at him and goes, you go to church? What an indictment on the life of a Christian. If you were going to be tried as for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence in your life to convict you? That's the light of God. That's the light we're to reflect. Evident in the Beatitudes, evident in the salt passage, and evident in the light passage. Jesus is teaching something very profound here. Don't miss it. Christian, how are you living? One foot in the world, one foot in the church? I said it a million times. I said, get in or get out. Because you're not doing anybody any good with one foot in each. Amen? In the army, we call that dead weight. We go on a road march. <laughs> we, have, we go on a 15-mile road march tomorrow, and we're going to have the truck driving behind us. And this is for the sick, lame, and lazy. You get, oh, my foot hurts. You're like, get on the sick, lame, and lazy truck. And the only, the only guys who didn't have enough pride would get on that thing. The rest of us are like, oh, I'll be all right. And you're hurting. You just keep on trucking. Amen? So you're getting on that truck. The point is, how are you living your life, church? You want to be in the, in the church or you want to be out? The choice is yours, but you need to make a choice. If you think I'm kidding, let's see how he closes this passage. You're the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, Jesus said, in the same way salt preserves food, in the same way light gives light, you should let your good deeds shine out for the whole world to see that they, everyone will praise your Father in heaven. Amen? How you doing, church? How you doing there? How are you doing there? It's interesting, there's a break in here as he begins to talk about the law. I'm going to stop there. He begins to talk about the law, but then he goes into teaching about anger and lust and everything else. Right back to how a Christian ought to behave. Church, we don't live this way. We wonder what's wrong with our church. There it is. I used to teach the D.A.R.E. program, and I had to go into an inner city school to teach it. And uh, this school was rough, rough. And I go in there. And most of these kids can't stand the police as it is. And I'm standing in full uniform, gun belt and everything, and they're looking at me like, mm hmm <laughs> And so I go in there, and uh, I began to teach. It was tough the first week. because They had their guard up. They had their walls up. Second week, I come back, teach them some more. And all I did was just love them, just love these kids like they were my own. And they didn't trust me. <laughs> I don't blame them. You know, I was their age. I don't know that I trusted the police either. But anyway, I kept coming back, I kept coming back, and it was a 17-week curriculum that I taught. It took a whole semester to get through, probably about week five. And I'd entertain questions at the end. They had a little dare box they could put their questions in. I'd ask their questions and answer them honestly. They didn't have to reveal who wrote the questions so there's no embarrassment. It was a really cool program. It's 
building bridges into communities. It was awesome, building bridges into people's lives. And uh, one kid told me, and he had, the, he had the fortitude to raise his hand and say, he didn't write it on a piece of paper. And this is what he said, Officer Burgos. I said, yes. He said, I got to tell you, I didn't like you when you walked in here the first day. And I looked at him, and I was like, okay. And he says, I didn't trust you. I said, all right. Because then after a week or two, he said, I started thinking you were kind of cool. You are kind of funny. I started liking you a little bit. He said, but now it's about week five or six. He goes, he says, I believe that you, he said, I thought you were just pretending, you know, to be, he said, but I believe that you are the way you are. He says, and I, th and I think you really do care about us. He says, and I, and I like you, man. He said, basically, my opinion of you has changed. And I said, oh. And he said, and I'm putting it, it's a fifth grader now. He said, he didn't use this word, but he said, because of the consistency that he saw in my life. He says, the way I carried myself, the way I acted in the school and outside of the school, I'd run into these kids in the supermarket or at the park, and I would talk to them and treat them in the same way. And they got to see me. And so this code of ethics, if you will, the way I behaved, the way I carried myself, the way I conducted myself mattered. I had another dare officer tell me, he says, man, I was, see, I don't drink alcohol. And we're teaching these kids about alcohol abuse and, and drug abuse. And another policeman said, he said he was at a, at a baseball game. He said, and he, he went up to, my Ron, I'm buying. He goes up to go buy the beers. He's got a handful of, like six, seven, eight beers in his hand. He's going back. He said, beers dripping down his hand. He's sipping the cup, trying to keep it from spilling. And the kid goes, hey, officer friendly. He goes, hey, hey. He says, and I felt like a total moron. I started laughing. I said, why? He said, well, I got a handful of beer and I'm teaching them not to drink. I said, well, what'd you do? Then he had to go backpedal. And un it was just, I think he handled it well because you're teaching a kid who's not able to drink because of his age and the harmful effects, but he is an adult. If he wants to drink, that's his business. And so anyway, my point is being a role model to people, being an example to people. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. How are you doing in reflecting the image of God in your life? Because that's what we are. Jesus said we're the light of the world, but those passages we read clearly say he is the light of the world. We are the little Christians. We are the little Jesus. We are to live our life in a manner that we reflect the light of Christ. How are you doing there? I'm not talking about in your house, about at work. How about in the line at the gas station when the guy in front of you is like, uh, three more lottery tickets, please. And you're like, dude. <laughs> when somebody cuts you off in traffic. How are you doing there? Because he's clearly teaching about how we ought to live, how we ought to interact. So I got to ask you, church, that's the million dollar question of the day. He moves into a passage about the law. I'm going to talk about that next week. And then he proceeds to teach about anger, lust, divorce, making promises, and even revenge. I'm going to try to cover that next week. That's going to be an interesting challenge. Well, my challenge for you today is this. Honest, don't answer out loud. Ask yourself. And if you say, I'm doing pretty good, ask God to reveal it to you. Because we're often our own cheerleaders. <laughs> I'm not doing too bad. I'm better than I was yesterday. Were you? Are you? Ask God. I guarantee you he'll put his finger on an area of your life that you're not doing so good in, that needs work or whatever the case may be. Don't look at your brother. Examine yourself and ask yourself, am I the salt and am I the light that Jesus called me to be? Join me as we pray, and the praise team comes forward, and we close. Our Father in heaven, Lord, Father, I thank you for this time you've allowed us to gather together, Lord, to worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth. Father, I thank you for your word that's true, and it does never, ever change, Lord. The word of God is eternal. Father, it's something we can build our life on. Father, I thank you for the standard, Lord. It seems like an impossible standard to achieve, and yet it is. It is only by your grace and your mercy, Lord, that we are righteous in your sight. Father, I thank you for that, for your love and your mercy and your forgiveness in our lives. But, Father, we, as a church, as a whole, not this church, but your church here on earth, Lord, has lost our desire for holiness. We've forgotten, Lord, that you are indeed holy and you deserve our best. Fathers, we come before you today, Lord. I admit in my life, Lord, I've not always been the best reflector of your light. And Father, I ask for your forgiveness, that you help continue to grow me, Lord. Help me, Lord, to continue to, uh, to, to desire 
to grow in like Christ's likeness, Lord, so that I can be the reflector of that light. Father, I pray that my good deeds would be examined by people and that they would glorify you. Father, I pray that same prayer for this church, Lord, for those that are here. Father, help us, Lord, to be the reflectors of the light that Jesus called us to be. We are indeed the light of the world, Lord, and yet the, the world in which we live in continues to look darker and darker. Father, it's because we're not reflecting your light. Forgive us, Lord. And Father, as far as salt goes, Lord, I believe the only reason why your judgment hasn't landed, hasn't fallen by now, was because of the remnant, the faithful few, that are indeed the salt. But Father, there's so much more of us that are called to be the salt, yet we refuse to be the salt. Forgive us, Father. I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to be a part of the solution rather than part of the problem in a world that's decaying and needs to hear your truth. Father, we praise you and thank you for this day and for this time you've allowed us to gather. Father, challenge us, Lord. Father, in the words of, of Teresa, Lord, a little salt goes a long way. Many of us are unwilling to sprinkle any at all. Father, help us to be the salt and the light that you've called us to be. Forgive us for failing you miserably, Lord. But give us another chance, Lord. Give us another opportunity. And I pray for faithfulness as we, as your people, strive to be the salt and light that you've called us to be. Father, thank you for this day.